morning, everybody, and welcome on this beautiful day to a beautiful room with a beautiful view, and we don't even charge you. <laughs> I'm Artemis Kirk, University Librarian, and I am delighted that we are offering the workshop called Get It Right, Negotiating the Publishing Contract and Rights to Your Scholarship. We're delighted to see so many faculty members and librarians here, and we are hopeful that when you leave this program, you will have a sense of how to negotiate your own agreements uh, and contracts to retain certain rights to your work. Our expert panelists will provide you with practical advice on how to take an active approach to managing copyright and intellectual property in your works. When you leave, we hope you'll have the background and knowledge to negotiate effectively with publishers and to preserve the rights you need as an author, educator, and scholar. And when in doubt, Always consult your scholarly communications and copyright librarian, whom I will introduce from Georgetown University right now, Meg Oakley, who is our Director of Scholarly Communications and Copyright at the University Library. Meg. <laughs> Thank you to Jenny Smith and to Grace McKinney and to Katie Thomas for organizing this event and for providing the delicious refreshments, which, if you didn't see, are in the ante room behind there. Meg. <laughs> Thank you. Artemis. I join Artemis in welcoming, welcoming all of you to our event today. Thank you for coming. I know there's a lot going on around campus and around town today, so we appreciate you coming here. I just wanted to very quickly uh, introduce our speakers to you. Uh, we have Jan Constantine from the Authors Guild, Kyle Courtney from Harvard University, and Laura Leisham from Georgetown University Press right down the street. Uh, Jana Vovides will be our moderator today, and we'll get started in just a couple minutes, but I wanted to also introduce you to members of our Scholarly Communication Committee. Uh, Jana is one of our members, Carol Sargent from the Office of Scholarly Publications, Morgan Stoddard from the Law Library, Bill Olson from here in Lowinger, Laura Bishop from Kennedy Institute for Ethics, Richard Brown, who uh, unfortunately could not join us today, GU Press, and me. So <laughs> thank you all for coming. And I will introduce you to Yana. Yana is the Director of Learning and Design Research at Candles, Georgetown University's Center for New Designs, Learning, and Scholarship, and is a visiting associate professor in the Department of Communication, Culture, and Technology. <coughs> Prior to coming to Georgetown, Yana was Director of Instructional Design at the George Washington University and taught in the International Education Program of the Graduate School of Education and Human Development. Yana has a PhD in Instructional Design and Technology from the University of Iowa, and you join me in welcoming her as our moderator today. Well, I volunteered to moderate this session because I found the panelists such an interesting group of people and I hope that all of you join after they do their presentations in a lot of question and answer and, and discussion. But um, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the format and then I'll introduce each panelist as before their presentation. So the format is we have three panelists, all experts in their field, they will be presenting for about 20 minutes each, and then after that, we hope to have a discussion and we'll open it up. Um, so our first panelist is going to be Laura Leisham. Yeah. I said it right, yeah. I, I did practice a little bit. but Laura is Digital Publishing and Rights Manager at Georgetown University Press, where she oversees electronic publishing efforts manages rights and permissions, and pursues co-publications and translations. Prior to her appointment at GU Press, Laura was marketing manager at Northwestern <coughs> University Press and Rights Coordinator at the United States Institutes of Peace. Laura is a graduate of Northwestern University, Midwest, we love that, and has an MFA in creative writing from the University of Maryland. And I welcome <coughs> Laura to, to the podium. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see so many of you here. Let me get things rolling here. Okay, 
I just wanted to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from, and I also wanted to know a little bit of information about all of you. So I'll start with all of you. Um, how many of you would be potentially first-time authors or publishers? Anybody? Or is everybody? Okay, good to know. So how many of you would identify as humanities, social sciences? Awesome. I have a little preference for that, just personal. <laughs> how about hard sciences? Okay, great. Okay, that gives me a little feel for where where everybody is coming from in the audience. I don't know anything about the press. Um, I'll just give you a brief um, overview. Um, we are a pretty traditional university press. Um, we publish about 40 books and three journals, 40 books a year and three journals. Um, we publish quality mm -hmm. peer-reviewed um, uh, content. And we are based right off campus here, as was mentioned. And we focus mostly on the subject areas that are in the humanities and social sciences, which is kind of why I asked where everybody was at, so you know where I'm coming from, too. Um, if you're going to ask me some serious STEM publishing questions, I can maybe tell you a little bit, but um, not my area of expertise. Um, so we publish at Georgetown in the areas of bioethics, religion and ethics, international affairs, political science, public policy, and public management, as well as languages and linguistics. In particular, um, we do language textbooks, which makes us actually a little bit unusual for a university press. Um, so I just wanted to give you kind of a, a little bit of background on that. So I'll get started. I'm going to give an overview. This may be familiar to some of you if you've already published before, but I think it's worth sort of just giving a general definition start out just talking about the big elephant in the room is copyright. So when you create something and you want to do something else with it, you automatically, when you create something in a fixed form, as it's called, it has copyright. You have exclusive legal right to reproduce, publish, sell, or distribute, distribute that something, wherever that may be. Um, and what I really want to focus on is the exclusivity. That's the important piece, because that's what you would be potentially licensing away would be the exclusive right to somebody else to do something with your work. You could also license individual pieces of that copyright, and I'll get into describing what those pieces are, because copyright really is a bundle of rights. Um, and that means that you have other sort of sub-rights licenses <coughs> that you could do. You could license one piece away, as in you could license someone to just publish something in Italian, for example, and I'll get into more detail. And I also wanted to sort of give a little overview of why a publisher might want to ask you to transfer that copyright to them or to give them complete exclusive rights. Um, there are several reasons why we'd want, like you to do that. First of all, we're your publishing partner and we'd like to do everything possible um, to manage and protect your rights. Also to ensure you get proper credit and you get compensation as well for your very hard work could have been years of research, lots of writing, rewriting. We understand all of that really very well. We also want to have the ability to promote your work in the widest possible way, disseminate it everywhere, and promote the discoverability of your work. And the way that we can do that is by having that kind of exclusive right to um, license, sub-license, to distribute it all over the world, make any sort of arrangements and partnerships that we need to. It just makes our job um, that much easier. And also, I wanted to emphasize again that a publisher takes on a significant amount of risk when they take on any kind of project. Um, so it is indeed a risky business to be in publishing for more than one reason. Not only because of all the different competitors and Amazon and I'm sure all of the various things that you've heard about recently, the digital shift, but it's always been a bit of a risky endeavor because we're putting a lot of effort, a lot of money, a lot of time into producing the work, <coughs> we're editing, we're um, typesetting it, we're laying it out, we're presenting it to the world, we're designing that book cover for you, we're putting it out there to all the possible partners in the world that could help distribute it and get it out to readers and get it used. Um, so we're really taking on quite a bit of risk and we're happy to do that uh, when we make an agreement with you and you've um, gone through our process of being approved as an author, that is something we're happy to take on. Um, and we, we're happy to have that, um, make that investment and also happy to maintain those relationships that make that possible. And there are so numerous, I can't even tell you how many there are. We, everybody in my, just in my department alone, I maintain a vast network of relationships with um, people in the digital publishing area, foreign publishers all over the world, and that's just my little department, which is basically me. <laughs> so all of my colleagues are maintaining myriad relationships as well, and that is, they're all working on your behalf. 
The other thing I wanted to mention, and I'm sure one of some of my colleagues, and I will preface this by saying I am not a lawyer. <laughs> I occasionally play one on TV, but I am not. <laughs> Um, so I will just say though that import, what's something that's really important to remember, it's not just the rights that you grant that's important to pay attention to, but it's also the termination and rights reversion clause that's in your contract, and I, so my colleagues might elaborate on that. Um, that's definitely something that you can um, negotiate as well, the terms of that. So it's not just what you're granting, it's how you would, might get those rights reverted back to you and how you might terminate that contract. Another important element is the copyright registration, and that's something you could um, negotiate as well, whether the copyright is registered in the name of the publisher or in your name. And that means basically inside the book on the copyright page, it would say that lovely copyright C symbol, your name, versus <coughs> GUP, for example. Also, there are some very significant differences in, as some of you might <coughs> know, who have published between a journal agreement and a book agreement. I'm not gonna get into the weeds with that, um, but essentially, there would be different elements you might want to keep in mind. Regardless of whether it's a journal, a book, and journals tend to have different sort of timelines for things. You might be able to reuse it or do things with it in a shorter time span because journals have a shorter sort of shelf life, as it were. Um, uh, so, but the rights that you should definitely consider to think about that might be important for you, specifically in your academic context, is Am I allowed to use this in the classroom? How am I allowed to use it? Am I allowed to share this with colleagues? And how am I allowed to do that? print, digital, however. Also, are you allowed to reuse it? Are you allowed to reprint it in future volumes that you author or edit? That's a really, really important thing, and I can tell you that we definitely offer that in our contracts. After a, a certain time period, whether for maybe six months to a year, depending on, they said, the type of publication, journal versus book, you would have that ability to do that, and that would be a gratis thing that you'd be able to do. Something that we've seen a lot more of as everything in our world becomes more digitized is um, some of our <laughs> authors asking for PDFs for internal review in their departments or at their institutions. And this is particularly important for tenure review. This is not something I thought we would even hear of a few years ago, but now it's super, super common. And so it's always worth asking. I don't think usually publishers <coughs> would have an issue with that, but I can't speak for everyone. So it's definitely worth um, ensuring that you might have access to an official final PDF file that you could share with a committee if you needed to. So it's really important, and we understand that for your career and anything you might need to do to further that. Also, another important piece, and um, my friends here at the library, who I work very closely with sometimes on our institutional repository here, which is called Digital Georgetown, is whether um, you might have the ability to post um, any type of file, um, whether it be an early version, let's say, of an art journal article or a final version, um, or a chapter of a book, perhaps, whether you'd be able to put that on your own personal website, or whether you'd be able to put that in an institutional repository at your institution. So there's a couple of things to really pay attention when you're, when you're considering a publication agreement. So next I wanted to unpack those, that bundle of rights a little bit. Um, I want to talk about subsidiary rights, or as we shorten it often, to sub-rights. I'm going to just highlight a few of the major ones and kind of just give you a brief overview of what that might mean. So again, this would be in the packet of rights that you're sort of signing over to a publishing partner. Um, some authors do choose to retain certain ones of these. Let's say you think you have a really hot memoir about your, you know, yourself and your life and you don't want to give away those film rights because you really think that somebody like Julia Roberts might want to play you in a movie. <laughs> and insert whatever other, are, uh, like is your favorite actor that would represent you. That is definitely your prerogative to try to negotiate to retain that right. So let me start at the top though. Co-publications is something you may not be that familiar with because it's not something that um, always happens and is a word that might not be thrown around a lot. That essentially means that a publisher would license um, rights to another publisher. It could be, it's usually actually in the English language, it's not a foreign language, that, that would be the next category. So we, for example, make deals with publishers in the UK. We also have made deals with publishers in India where we'd allow them to reprint the book in English for a specific market. And the benefits of this to you as an author, but also as a publisher, is simply discoverability and further dissemination. We do have a vast network, but each market has its own characteristics. And sometimes it's really beneficial to work with a partner in a certain territory or country to really get the best possible discoverability and the best possible sales. Um, um, out of it. So that is what a co-publication would be, and those can happen both like before your book gets published or afterwards. 
foreign language editions, that would be translations. We'd love to have your book appear as in many languages as possible. The reality is not every country, not every language maybe um, would want to have your book in, the, in that particular language, but um, depending on the subject matter um, and the content, like a general like academic content of your book, it may be possible that certain, um, certain other um, foreign publishers would be interested in, in doing an edition. Um, English is um, kind of a lingua franca for a lot of people, so sometimes publishers, just like we would consider, what is the risk or what would be the benefit of, of translating into another language, because it is very expensive <coughs> to do so, because you're going to be paying a translator as well as to buy the rights to actually do the, do the translation. Paperback rights, this might not happen that often um, with an academic title, but if you do, your book is originally published in hardcover, it's possible we may license rights for a paperback edition to a different publisher. And again, it would be just for the benefit of the book, as in that publisher has a wider reach, reach ha reaches a different audience, can do something for the book that we might not be able to do. Like I said, we're happy um, to make those kinds of arrangements. Audiobooks, pretty self-explanatory. Those are really fun. Um, you may think, who wants an audiobook of an academic book? A lot of people. Actually, um, I have had a lot of success licensing, licensing audiobook rights, and it's pretty cool, and um, usually authors are pretty excited about it. Um, so that's definitely a great thing for, uh, for me to have in the bundle of rights that I get to license out, and I'm always excited to be able to do that. Film, TV, drama, I touched on that a little bit earlier. Pretty rare, like in the UP world, but does happen in the university press world. Um, there are sometimes books that get adapted. You get a lot of options for films, which means people are interested and they kind of want to say, I want dibs on this to, to develop it, um, but not actually a lot of films actually get made. The percentage is really low. There's a lot of options that get asked for, but not a lot of films actually get made. But it does happen. Um, excerpts and permissions. So this piece of the bundle of rights means we, as a publisher, if you granted us this right, would be able to allow other people to reprint excerpts. And that could be a couple of pages. It could be a whole chapter. Um, and this is something we'd be happy to manage for you um, if you would grant us those rights. Um, and that could be anything from somebody wants to use a chapter in um, a course packet. They want to put it in an electronic or a print course packet. Or let's say another publisher wants to reprint several pages in another volume or a chapter in an anthology. Um, so that's what that um, means. First serial and second serial rights, if you're lucky enough to get interest from a nationally <laughs> ranked newspaper and or magazine, um, maybe you're writing on a really hot topic, it's current events or current affairs related, um, we are also happy to try to work on that too, if your book has that kind of potential. For example, we published a book on Hezbollah, which is, is still in the news very much now. We had very serious interest <laughs> and managed to place um, a first serial um, excerpt, which means pre-publication, um, a newspaper, let's say the Washington Post, for example, would say, we want the first rights to get to publish a brief excerpt from this book as sort of a teaser um, and sort of get, and it would also, it also benefits the newspaper actually too because they get sort of a valuable piece of content that hasn't been released yet. And it could be pretty groundbreaking as well because there are a lot of books that are written in academia actually that offer some controversial opinions or information, research that has not been released yet. Um, so if you really have something like that, um, we'd be happy to try to turn it into something that appears in a national newspaper. Second serial would just be the second newspaper or journal or magazine that gets to do that. Like I said, if you're lucky enough to be able to do that, it's pretty fun. Okay, next I just want to talk about, now that I've talked a little bit about rights, I think the most important right that you have, if I can call it that, is you have the right to choose who you want to work with. And um, the more that you educate yourself about what's out there in the publishing landscape, um, the more you educate yourself about the situation with copyright, um, and there are lots of resources for that, including um, the organizations of my co-presenters, which I would recommend. Um, it's really, really important, that I would say is a fundamental right, is for you to decide who you want to publish and how you want to publish. And there are, are several things to keep in mind, as again, I'm speaking from an ap academic publishing perspective, a university press perspective, and I will say the academic publishing options are more diverse and plentiful than ever before, just like in publishing in general. So it can get a little bit like, can't see the forest for the trees. There's so many options, so many different ways you could possibly do this. Of course, there are some caveats to that. 
there's things to think about. Um, you may have a certain idea of how you need to be published based on the discipline or the subject area that you're working in. As I just mentioned, if you're working in a STEM area journal, publishing is much more frequent than maybe a whole book. Um, you may want to publish in certain types of publications. Uh, you also need to think about, is your book that you're writing more of a very niche book for a very specific small audience, or are you really trying to reach a broader audience, and you might want to choose your publishing partner based on that. Also, it's all about format options, too. And these are all things I would say, if you're looking for a publishing partner, these are things you should look for. If you go research on their website, if you meet them at conferences and exhibits, this is the kinds of things that you should kind of ask yourself and look at what they're doing to make an educated decision. So as far as formats, most people, I think, do print and digital now, but how do they do that? What is the range of, that, of their ability to do that as a publisher? Do they have digital-only options? What are they? Um, do they have the ability, have they published websites where there are data sets, um, other things, uh, kind of maybe unusual things that don't fit into a book container? Do they have the ability to deal with that kind of research or content? Um, if you need something like that, doing a little research, even just talking to other colleagues, things like that, of like, where, who's doing this kind of work? Apps, yes, we're all getting into this. Um, I will say, this is just another caveat, they are very expensive to develop. They're also super fun if you can do it. Um, but everybody wants to buy them for 99 cents. So price point <laughs> and the investment don't really line up. Um, but anyway, if, if that fits what type of content you're doing, if that's what you, the functionality that you need to present the content, you really might want to check out um, some of the publishers that are working on this. And they're not just trade publishers. These are academic publishers that I know of that have done projects like this. Some of them are reference apps, such as dictionaries. Um, they're really useful and can be used by not just academics, obviously. You can find them in any app store, you know, in iTunes, anywhere, and like a general audience person can, can access them and use them. Next would be decisions about traditional. I put this in quotes because I feel like it's a misnomer because a lot of these models actually have elements of what you would call traditional publishing, but I guess traditional in the way of you're selling something probably, it's commercial, you're going through a typical process of editorial and production, and it's being sort of packaged in a traditional way, um, with a book cover, with marketing copy, all that business. Um, but that's not to say that doesn't happen in any of these others, because it definitely does. Um, so traditional, in the very, very limited sense of the traditional word, and then open access, and then even self-publishing could be an option. Again, it just depends on what type of content you're trying to put out there. The caveat for that is the item right before that is requirements based on your funding sources. And that may limit, and that's the first thing you should look at, that may limit what your options might be. But that doesn't mean you don't have any options. It just may curtail, like you may have a, an, an obligation to make something open access. But that doesn't mean you can't work with a traditional publisher, actually. It may mean you have to be upfront about that, you have to ask the right questions, and see what the possibility is to write into your contract, maybe something about making it open access at a certain point or to make it open access to a certain institution. Peer review. This is a really big one. Um, this is obviously a paramount of importance in academia, and it is something that is a hallmark of presses like the ones I work for, which is university presses, but of course there are a plethora of other types of academic publishers that would do this. Um, it's really important to have this, obviously, if you want a sort of um, imprimatur um, a legitimacy, a rep like you need to have that um, um, peer review happening. And like I just said, mentioned, do your research. Be an educated consumer, as it were. Um, I'm not up here to give you a commercial to work with at university presses or anything like that. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of an overview. And next, I want to tell you what it would be like to maybe, if you did work with us, what kind of value we could give to you. But I definitely encourage you to do some research on your own. Um, it was already mentioned, get in touch with your scholarly communications office, professional organizations, whether it's like the Authors Guild, whether it's your own professional organization. I know if you're part of anything, like let's say you're part of the American Academy of Religion or whatever, they often have a lot of resources available, whether on their websites, to their members. Um, it's worth joining those organizations and finding out what kind of resources they have for you. It can be very valuable. But also just becoming really familiar, like you're actually in the middle of this. You're the ones doing research, you're reading a lot of other materials, pay good attention to the publishers in your subject areas that are doing the kinds of things that make you excited. Who is publishing the, the kind of work that you're most excited about and is related to what you're doing? Also, book exhibits at conferences. We go to a ton of conferences every year. You can see a list of them on our website. 
That is a big acquisitions tool for us, actually. And I would tell you, our acquisitions editors don't bite. <laughs> they want to talk to you. They, they are our talent scouts. I mean, they're our course, like, you know, if you bring us something that's totally out of left field and is not part of the subject area, I will say yes. They probably will politely say, that's very interesting, but we're not, you know, we don't acquire in that area. But if you come approach us and say, I am working in bioethics, for example, one of our subject areas, and this is the kind of project I want to do, they're going to respond to that and say, yes, yes, this is exactly what we're doing. Or no, maybe not, but I can recommend maybe another publisher that might be doing something like that, because they're very knowledgeable about their fields. Also, just note book reviews and awards, of course. Like, who's doing the kind of amazing award-winning work um, and stuff that's getting attention publicity-wise um, that is similar to what you're doing or is um, really making you excited. Okay, and then the next, I just want to finally, this is my only real like commercial or pitch, I guess you'd say, like for what might happen. This is um, a little overview of the value of working with a professional academic publisher. As I sort of touched on a little bit before, we do have um, a reputation um, for quality peer-reviewed content. Um, we have brand recognition. Um, something that comes from Georgetown University Press has a certain brand attached to it. We are very well known for publishing certain subject areas and for, like I said, doing quality content. Also, what you're getting is editorial and production expertise. Um, and this is all stuff that we actually share with our authors. And I'm going to see if I can actually make, um, I don't think I can make this link work on here right now, but I can show you at the end our website. We have a whole page um, on our website that is basically says for our authors, and that means both potential and current authors. And we describe the whole process that your book will go through, including peer review, the kinds of editorial and production expertise and services you're going to get. And that includes copy editing, proofreading, but also our acquisitions folks often work with you on shaping your book a little bit. Um, as well, you're getting a book cover, you're getting a really well thought out, laid out design of the book, presenting your content, the information in a clear way, um, and up to all of the sort of standards of information presentation today. And another really important piece, and I already talked about our network of relationships that we have, is marketing and sales. And this is the kind of thing that you really want to check out what a publisher is doing. And again, we have a lot of information on our website about our international distribution partners, all of our sales reps all over the world. Um, we have a whole page that lists all of the recent rights and sub rights agreements that we've made. Um, it tells you where we're going to be presenting at, at, at conferences, at what book exhibits we're participating in, catalogs, and other marketing material. This includes not only in print now, but sent out digitally, email marketing. We're going to send out your book for review. We're going to try to set up events for you. We're going to do award submissions. And this is no small thing. This is all, like I said, organized by myself and my colleagues. There are 15 of us. And we do all of these aspects for your book. Also, we promote, and this is really important for a lot of academic texts, we promote course adoption. And we do this by offering desk and exam copies. I'm sure almost every single one of you must have asked for a desk or exam copy at some point. This is highly important um, for the visibility of your book and also to get um, a larger audience and more use for your content. And that is really one of our main goals as well. I can't emphasize that enough. That is a really important market for us and we're really interested in getting your, your content used. And we really want to help people ultimately do more exciting research and also we want to help people learn. We want to help undergraduates, graduate students. We want to um, uh, help them learn about the newest um, scholarly research in whatever subject area you're working in. I already touched a little bit on subrights and licensing activity. Um, all those subrights that I listed, if you grant those to us in a, that bundle of rights, we will be working actively to make those arrangements for you and we'll be responding to interest. We attend Frankfurt Book Fair, um, which is the largest international rights book fair in the entire world. We go every year. We have nothing but wall-to-wall -wall meetings for three to four days and it's really fun and exciting and I get to meet amazing people and make a lot of really interesting connections and a lot of different licensing arrangements for your content. Another huge, huge thing is digital distribution, and I'm heavily involved in this as well. Um, and this is not just ebook availability on something like Amazon, which is actually something you could do as a self-publisher. You could make your book with a few clicks available on Amazon. But what we give you is access to a lot of other digital um, platforms, and that includes things that you probably use in your research, like Muse and JSTOR. We have relationships with all of those digital partners. <coughs> Also, we might actually have some options for really innovative content format and delivery. And when that means, and we do one of these options, which is um, different kinds of formats for, or genres of, 
scholarly publishing, um, and this is really big right now in the UP world, is digital shorts. So this is a, a piece of scholarly content that is somewhere between a journal article and a book, about 10,000 to 40,000 words. We're experimenting with this. They're digital only for us right now. It's really exciting because we have all sorts of different people, current authors actually, who have said like, hey, this is exactly what I need for this little side project I was doing, for example. It doesn't really fit in either of those categories, but it's going to fit here. And we're really excited to explore this. And like I said, it's a total experiment. I have several colleagues at other UPs that are doing this, though. They've all found kind of cutesy name for some of these, too. Actually, ours are just called Georgetown Digital Shorts. Um, another one's called Pinpoints. Another one's called, I think, uh, Chicago Briefs or something like that. You get into a little, like, it gets a little funny after a while because <laughs> everybody's trying to be unique in how they name them. But essentially, they're all people like, have a very similar idea behind them. Also, you may be surprised or not to hear that some major traditional academic publishers have open access options. Um, just a few days ago, actually, um, Cambridge University Press um, announced a new open access monograph option. Um, California Press is huge in this area. They have announced, made several announcements recently in the past couple years of their open access initiatives, and it really, I would really encourage you to look into those. Um, so don't um, count out traditional publishers. Um, we actually are very in touch with um, what's going on in scholarly communications in general, um, where things are moving forward, and um, we're trying to provide any sort of way to help people get their work out in new um, and more relevant ways. Also, basic online social media presence, too. We have a website. We obviously we tweet. We post things on Tumblr. We have a YouTube um, station as well. So there's things you might want to keep in, again, what's appropriate for your content. You can kind of tell. Check out the publisher's website. Ask the acquisitions person or whoever you're talking to the press kind of what's going on. Um, and so, like I said, in general, the big, big thing is we're all about assisting you with discoverability. That's what it's what all of these pieces are actually working towards is to help you do that. Um, and like I said, that would be one of the greatest values to the benefits of, of working with a more um, traditional academic publishing partner, perhaps. Um, we really just want to get your content out there. We want to get it noticed. We want to get it reviewed. We want to get it used by people. We want people to be engaging with it. We want to be people to have a real um, sense of what is going on in the scholarly discussions right now. Um, and like I said, I think discoverability and engagement would be the two words that I would <clears throat> probably leave you with as what you could get if you worked with us. Thank you. So thanks very much. Thank you, thank you Laura. Not um, going to even try your last name again. <laughs> it's all right. It's but, um, You'll notice that I took my glasses off. I realized when I was trying to read earlier that I couldn't really make out the words on the page. Is that, you know, we're going to edit that out. <laughs> but our next panelist is Jan Constantine. She serves as general counsel for the Authors Guild, the nation's oldest and largest professional organization for writers. In addition to her other responsibilities in supervising the Guild's legal services division, Jan has been overseeing the Authors Guild et al. versus Google Inc. litigation, a class action filed in September 2005. So now I have to. She is a partner of the law firm Constantine Cannon, where she focuses on intellectual property and employment law, and has counseled clients in numerous areas, including the First Amendment, copyright, advertising and marketing, and antitrust and trade regulation. She frequently lectures on various subjects related to intellectual property and was an adjunct professor at NYU School of Continuing and Professional Studies from 2005 to 2013. Jan is a graduate of the Smith College and George Washington U University's National Law Center. And we welcome Jan to the podium. Thank you. Well, I am a lawyer, as you can tell, um, but I'm a very nice person, and I'm also, <laughs> and I'm also a cabaret singer on the side, and yeah. Carol has seen two of my boy, performances, brilliant. in New York. so I uh, just want to put everything out there. <laughs> but also, everything I say is basically a commercial for you to join the Authors Guild, so in uh, true commercial, um, 
Thalia, I just, I'm going to leave some things on the table, which are pamphlets for the Authors Guild, and after I speak, you'll see why you need me. Um, <laughs> the model trade book contract and commentary I'm going to give to Carol, it, it comes with your $125 annual membership. And this is focused really more on trade as opposed to uh, university press. But I'm going to talk about the university piece. Um, and it basically, it's a model contract with commentary which says, you're really not going to get the model clauses, but here are some backup just in case. So that's, that's my first commercial. Let me give you, oh, you got my back side. That's not a good thing. <laughs> um, the second is the pamphlet which I left in the table, which talks about the Authors Guild and what we do. And, um, and lastly, I'm just going to get my outline and, and say that most of the things in the PowerPoint, I could have used that PowerPoint myself, and uh, Laura did me a favor by making it so they didn't have to do that. Um, I'm an advocate. Uh, I sued Google, and if I had the money, I would sue Amazon, too. <laughs> so it, you have to take everything with a grain of salt, because for everybody who's like Laura, who's honest and you know, reputable and has a university press where they're very author-centric um, and they want the authors to succeed, there's a Simon Legree out there, whether it be in trade press or in university press or in some other kind of press that really wants to take advantage of authors or even doesn't do it on purpose, but the, the clauses in their contract are so onerous that if an author um, reads them, uh, or usually authors don't read them, you're so happy to get published by anyone that you just sign anything. <laughs> and you know that's why Carol Sargent and others in those positions are here for you, because even you know in a con I haven't seen Laura's contract, but she mentioned something which I will talk about in my presentation: uh, whose name the copyright should be in. Now, to me as an advocate for an author. There is no question about whose name it should be in. You created it. This is your blood, sweat, and tears. It's got to be in your name. Now, I can think of a couple of circumstances if somebody's doing a series where there are many people who are contributing, and there's an editor, <coughs> and it's a series perhaps created by or branded by the university press. OK, I understand that. Or if it's a revision, and um, the the press has created it, but there's a reviser, and the author is going to get credit, but not as a, in a copyright sense. I could understand that. But ask Laura at the Q&A, what circumstances would there be that the copyright would be in the publisher's name? And uh, th the problem with this is that every contract that I've seen has, has a, the default in the publisher's name, and every time that my legal services people push back and say, this should be in the author's name, I'd say 9.99 times they say, fine. So why have a contract which says copyright in the publisher's name if you're going to give that up in the first place? So we are starting a fair contract terms initiative at the Authors Guild where we're going to go to some of the more egregious publishers, and I have to say, the the university presses are not among them. But some of their contracts are very ancient, and um, they're there mostly because, well, we've always done it that way, so why, why change it now? We're going to ask them to change it now, because it's the digital world, and there are new things that are happening, as Laura so, so um, aptly put it. And I think it's important that we rethink some of these clauses. And in anticipation of this talk, I spoke to three or four other uh, university press editors, and several of my um, clients that Carol has sent me over the years, uh, who um, all had issues resolved, be it contract or some disputes. And I'll give you some benefit of what they've said, and uh, Carol and I have worked together for many years, and we've it been very successful in, a, in being able to get authors what they deserve to get. Um, so uh, I was going to ask who you are. Now I know. So thank you, Laura, for that. 
Uh, there's a lot of differences depending on what subject matter or genre in, in trade uh, you write for. For example, I spoke with somebody at the University Press who works uh, specifically on literature and film. And he said he has to do a lot of books, 40 books plus a year and in his division alone. And he said because nobody buys critical books about literature or film in, in uh, universities. They buy the primary source. So when you read Dickens or when you read, you know, uh, when you see a film, that's what the, the teacher is going to <coughs> present to the student. So their books are in, to be bought by libraries. And most of these books that he signs on only sell 400 books a year. That's very different than, than uh, he, most of the humanities uh, that you do, I'm sure. Um, but in thinking about bringing somebody on who's only going to sell 400 books a year, now I'm not saying that that's not worth doing. It, it is worth doing. He needs to have a critical mass of books in order to justify his very existence, he said. <laughs> that being said, I said, well, should I tell these people to get agents or not? He said, well, if I have an agent or somebody who's really going to push back, I'm not going to even bother publishing that book because for 400 books, it's not worth it. Um, but on the other hand, he said, you know, I, I, you know, there are a lot of other books that I might be able to publish who, with people who don't give me a hard time. Now that's very interesting and that makes me think as an advocate, I don't want to push too hard because then somebody's not going to get their first book published under those circumstances. So the best thing that Laura said in my view, and I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize that myself, do your research. Go to the resources. As um, one of our satisfied customers said, Gary um, Wasserman, who is now an em emeritus, and he, he's taught at Doha, I don't know if any of you know him. He said, um, and it was a great quote, so let's see if I can get it. He said, it's very important to um, understand that the contract is just part of the writing process. And it's the, you know, it's the icing on the cake. But you shouldn't stop when you finish your book. You should continue to do serious research, just like what you're doing when you're preparing your book, in order to find the right fit for you. And uh, he's absolutely right. He said in, in the 70s when he signed his first book contract, he was so happy to have a contract, he didn't even bother to read it. This is an intelligent person. You all look pretty intelligent to me because you're nodding when I talk to you. But, it, you know, I cannot, when, I, when people tell me, oh, I just signed this contract and, um, you know, now I realize what it said, I shouldn't have signed that term. The, the first person that, that Carol and I dealt with was a guy who had his thesis turned into a book by an academic press. And it was about the uh, oil in the Middle East. And there was a clause there which said, under no circumstances could he publish another book about oil in the Middle East without getting prior written approval from the publisher. Now this is not, trust me, is that an unusual contract term? It's not. Um, and this poor guy, spent 30 years of his life only studying and teaching about oil in the Middle East. So we went to the publisher and we, we got permission for the publisher to do a book with another press. But things like that, I mean, if you read that, you'd say, oh my god, I would never sign that. Nobody reads these contracts. They just want to get, you know, tenure or a bump up in their, you know, salary or whatever. But that's what we're here for. We're not here to make it impossible for you to get a book published, but we're here to just say, did you read that? Make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. We're here as an emergency if things go bad. Um, and if you don't have somebody like Laura who's really looking out for you. But do read it first, and, and that's important. Um, you know, again, 
Some academic books are considered trade books. Uh, one of our vice presidents of the Authors Guild is uh, James Shapiro. He teaches at Columbia. And he writes about Shakespeare. And all of his books are sold in the trade market at bookstores, etc. So just because you're an academic doesn't mean you can't write a great memoir about you know, your life and times or something that could be considered trade, in which case the model contract there is more opposite to what what you're doing. And I'm really going to focus on some of the clauses in the, uh, what I would call the general university press. Um, the academic presses, I have to say, are relatively few in the universe of presses, although Laura's presentation showed you how many options you have. In reality, you know, for your particular subject matter, there probably aren't that many options. There is the self-publishing option, which is new to you now, and which in, in certain cases might be a good thing. Um, there's a general warning, increasingly hard to tell if you're being offered a good publishing deal or something that's smoke and mirrors. And I'm going to give you, in very broad brush, uh, four sorts of deals. Generally, option one, this is a good deal. You have a recognized publisher paying you in advance in royalties um, and making a significant upfront investment in the work, meeting the costs of illustrations, permissions, index, doing everything that Laura said her press did. And that's, that's good. That's, we'll, we'll call that kind of traditional. Option two, poor. <laughs> Print on demand, <coughs> ebook only proposals. Now, it looks like option one, but there's no advance, um, there's no marketing, it relies on authors to promote for the most part, and there's a minimal cost of a publisher to set up, but they may not have the publishing credentials to actually do anything and get your book discoverable. So you have to really watch out when it, some, something is pr print on demand, you know what that is. It's no book gets printed until there's an order. So it's not like they, they print 400 books and 400 books get sold to the libraries. They only print from a catalog when there, there's an order. So you have, to, you have to know that. But in return for this minimal, de minimus investment, they ask for all rights for as long as possible, copyright term, and a very significant percentage of the income generated, if any, by book sales and licenses. And the downside, obviously, for an author is these rights are tied up for years, very low royalty rates, books will not be sold at bookstores or reviewed in the press. So that's not a great option, as, as I said. Option three is probably worth considering, and that's self-publishing. And other than works with complex layout or illustrations, authors can publish print-on-demand and e-books cheaply and relatively easily now. So it might be a serious option for you guys. And option four I would call very poor. <laughs> and that is the author pays publisher money or obligates himself to buy a certain number of books and grants a license of rights. Now in academic publishing there is a subvention practice which is necessary at times to get a book published by an academic press. And there's no shame in that. But you know it's got to be the right situation. These other circumstances are you get a press you get somebody who really wants to get published, and they say, oh, we'll be happy to publish you, but you have to commit to buying you know, the 3,000 books, and send us a check up front for $7,000 or something like that. Avoid that like the plague. Um, just a general discussion about contract terms, and I'll pick and choose some terms that I think are more out outrageous than others, because I don't want to take up too much time, but do throw questions at me at the Q&A. So as, as Gary said, and this is his word, writing a book is a holistic process of which the publishing contract is an important part. You should treat the contract process in a similar way to the book creation. And you should defer to the expertise of others who know this stuff. The Authors Guild, Carol Sargent. How to publish, how to market, who to go to, who to, to have an agent or not. Uh, research options, uh, as Laura said, there are many experts in your fields and outside your fields and specialists that you can ask for advice and develop a strategy. 
be persistent, tenacious, tough-skinned because you're going to get rejected. Um, but, but in sum, come down from those ivory towers and actually read the contract. You've spent so much time writing the book. Don't drop the ball at the finish line. Um, and what Gary said to me also was very interesting, and I bet this is true of many of you. Confidence is the key. Authors are an important part of the process of publishing. You're not supplicants, in Gary's word. Mm -hmm. Without authors, publishing would not exist. So you have leverage. There are action points. You do your homework, and um, you'll be successful. Um, publishers sometimes imply that they're offering a standard contract. But even when true, and it's no means certain for the Simon Legrees out there, they're unlikely to withdraw an offer simply because the author asks for reasonable improvements, notwithstanding my, my friend at, uh, at the Oxford University Press. Nobody at these presses has ever said, I will, I'm firm, these contracts are standards, they're non-negotiable. There are certain terms that they will say are non-negotiable, which I say is bullshit, that's a legal term. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time, they'll be very honorable and reasonable, and they'll say, sure, not a problem. Um, obviously, there are concerns and points on which to take a firm stand will vary according to the status of the writer, or the author, the nature of the work, and other fact factors, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. So you ask for 10 things, you'll get five things. So make sure that you, know, you prioritize. Um, and if you join the Authors Guild, which I'm sure you will after this session, um, they will provide you, our lawyers, and we have foreign staff, with a point-by-point -point analysis of the contract terms and suggestions for reasonable terms which you, the author, can ask for or not. Nobody's going to say, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. You read it, you, you know, say, that doesn't make sense for me. Uh, in the end, you, the authors, have to be comfortable with this contract. So that's, that's my spiel. Now let me give you a couple of sections of the contract specifically, and then um, I'll sit down and, and turn it over to Kyle. Um, the work. You should have a detailed description of the work that is part of this contract so there's no ambiguity when you turn something in and they say, but you were, good, you were supposed to write about the Middle East oil crisis and you're writing about you know, Muppets in New York City in, in 1972, you really have to be on the same page with your publisher. Um, as far as rights granted clauses, we recommend, as I said before, that the author retains copyright. And, you know, I'd, I'd really like to know, other than the two I mentioned, I have heard one other situation where a publisher said that foreign um, publishers will not negotiate with authors. They want to negotiate directly with the publishers, but I, you know, for foreign language translations, and I haven't found that to be the case, frankly. And some agented authors specifically keep all rights for, you know, a foreign rights so that the agents can negotiate with the publishers or, or hire sub-agents in those countries. So I don't know why. But if you do assign a copyright, then there are certain safeguards. Um, don't make, don't allow any changes beyond routine uh, copy editing, editing. Make sure that you know the credit is to your liking. If there's a fee specified, have it paid on signing and delivery, not acceptance, but delivery. Um, and the fee should be for writing only, not other tasks like picture sourcing or index or whatever. And this is if you assign the copyright. You should have the first refusal to revise the book if there is a revision. There shouldn't be a non-compete in this kind of um, situation. And there shouldn't be any legal assignment of the copyright until the full fee is paid by the publisher. Now, as far as delivery goes, um, check for time is of the essence. That's a legal term which can always be a gotcha, because if you're a day late or three weeks late without mutual agreement by the publisher, they can use that against you and say, oh, you were three days late, terminating the agreement. So these are kind of legal, you know, phrases that you have to be available, you have to be um, 
that's you have to know about. Another one is approval or acceptance language is for purposes of rejection. Now, a lot of these contracts don't have any standards objective at all about why, what is approval. We always like to say editorial reasons because if they don't approve because there's another book coming out on the same subject that they didn't know about with another publisher, you've written the book. You fulfilled your obligations. They shouldn't be able to pull the plug on your book because of market circumstances. So that's, that's really important to, to get in there. Uh, as far as proofs are concerned, author you know, should get proofs, you should insist, and there is a specific turnaround time which you should agree to because you want to get your book out there. But if there are many over usually 10 or 15 percent changes, uh, author is asked to pay the printer's cost. So you have to be very aware of that. For some specialist non-fiction books, such as medical text, you guys over there, publishers have been known to pay for a subject specialist proofreader. You should not be charged for that. And if they do that, that's a good thing because they're investing in your book. Printing a publication. I haven't seen any contracts that I looked at just for the purposes of coming here in my files where there is actually a deadline for the publisher to publish the work. <laughs> now, you have a deadline and a delivery date, but the publisher basically says, we have all right, we, as far as we're concerned, all the details in publication, production, pricing, advertising, distribution are <coughs> under their <coughs> control. But they never say, and we'll publish within 12 months, 18 months for a more complex book. Now, most of them probably do that, but why? Why shouldn't that be in the agreement? There should be an expectation of when your book's going to get out there. And there should be certain things that you should insist on in certain cases, like consultation for a jacket design or a cover, or even a title. How can they change the title of your book without giving you approval over that? It's mind-boggling, but most of these, the language says they can do it. Whether they do it or not, it's probably an edge case, but they can do it if the contract says so. Indexing and permission fees, who pays that? For the most part, the contracts say the author has to pay for that. And in addition, if you have permissions, your manuscript will not be deemed accepted until all of the permissions are there. And if you have to pay for permissions, you guys have to pay for them. Now that's negotiable. You can try to get, at the very least, a 50-50 sharing, or um, you can get them to invest in you and pay for that. And in many cases, they're, they're willing to do that. I just had an author who was working with NYU University Press, and she got a small advance, about $1,000, and she said, take the advance, and you cover the indexing, and you cover the permission fees. And they said, fine, which she said, you keep the advance. I don't need the advance but I don't want to be stuck with that. And, and that was because I suggested that. So it does work. Um, I don't want to overstate my time. Royalties, you know, they're around, all up and down. But the thing that I don't want you to accept, and I don't know if you do it, so we'll have to talk later, is <laughs> royalties should be from book one, not from book 300 or book 500. And that I've seen recently in many, many cases. Book one, you know, I would accept book one lower royalty than, you know, a traditional royalty at book 500. I mean, give me a break. Um, print on demand. Uh, the most important thing, we've already talked about subrights, is uh, reversion of rights and termination. The problem with giving up all of these rights is if your publisher doesn't exploit them or any one of them, then you can't take it back and do it yourself. You can ask, but you don't have the right to do that. And a lot of publishers want exactly what Laura says. They want to have control so that they can make back their investment. Uh, and they are doing a good job in marketing and doing all the things that Laura said they were doing. But there are many publishers who just sit on their rights and do nothing. And if you've granted rights for the term of copyright, which is your life plus 70 years, you're never going to be able to do anything with that book again. 
So what we are trying to do is end the, you know, the pièce de résistance, if you will, is that in out of print clauses it says if a book is in print, which is defined now as being available for print on demand or an e-book, they can keep your rights forever. There is no reversion because you can usually before the digital world put in a, a provision which says if there are um, fewer than 300 books sold in two uh, adjacent royalty periods or you get fewer than a certain amount of money in these two periods, then it's deemed to be out of print and you can ask for your rights back and you will get your rights back, although it takes a long time because it's in the back burner of the publisher's uh, clerks and you'll never get that letter in a reasonable period of time. But um, now, if it's deemed to be in print because it's an e-book form, which costs very little money, and if it's in POD, which costs no money to have it in a catalog, you'll never get your rights back. So these are a lot of things that we're working on and that we like to discuss with our authors when we do our contract review. And we also, when uh, an author has difficulties with a, a publisher, uh, we will step in in a nice way, because suing doesn't make any sense except Google and Amazon. Um, <laughs> but I'll give you an example of the first matter that I handled at the Authors Guild, and I'm there almost 10 years. A cookbook author um, who had a, an expertise in um, Indian uh, regional cooking had a contract with HarperCollins. And over the course of several years, she had three different editors, and they all ended up moving and going to another place. And each editor that, that serviced her had changes to the cookbook. So she spent all of her $25,000 advance getting somebody to help her make changes and mailing the manuscripts back to HarperCollins. The last editor left and they said, it's not accepted. We're not going to accept the book. So, and give us our, our $25,000 advance back. We got all of the um, supporting documentation about her expenses that she was forced to do because of the unfair handing her over from editor to editor. And we got them to allow her not to, to actually pay back, if she got her book published elsewhere, no first proceeds, which means usually if, if you get bounced to another publisher, they take whatever is owed to them first. So they said, OK, we'll do the right thing. The University of uh, Southern Car California published it, gave her an advance, nowhere near the 25000 She won the James Beard Cooking Award that year. And it was a great result. And she's a terrific wow. person. And she was a very satisfied customer. And that's the kind of thing that happens in publishing. These are nice people at HarperCollins. I actually have a, a book, Danny and the Dinosaur, that was left to the Authors Guild as, you know, for, from Sid Ha. And we're working with them. We just got a big advance. But things happen, fall through the cracks, and you need an advocate to help you hold your hand through the muddle of publishing that, that can be, except at Georgetown University. <laughs> <laughs> We heard from Laura, and we heard a little bit about the publisher's perspective. We heard from Jan and about author's rights and really paying attention to that contract. Our next uh, panelist is going to be talking a little bit more about open access. Um, and so Kyle Courtney is copyright advisor and program manager at Harvard University's Office for Scholarly Communication. He also serves as a copyright law consultant for libraries, higher education institutions, nonprofit groups, and specialized archives. He teaches cyber law at Northeastern University, and he's a faculty scholar at Northeastern's law school. Previously, he was the manager of faculty research and scholarship at Harvard Law School, where he continues to teach first year legal research as part of the legal research and writing program. Kyle holds a JD with distinction, another lawyer, in intellectual property, property law, 
and uh, a master's in library um, sciences. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Carl was recently named one of the American Library Association's 2015 Movers and Shakers yes. for being a change agent. <laughs> Welcome, Carl. Thank you. Um, <laughs> The mover and shaker status does not involve me dancing at all, uh, which is what a lot of my colleagues was like, what does a mover and shaker mean? Uh, so I'm here to talk a little bit about um, open access publishing, and uh, I use the uh, cherry blossoms uh, as a backdrop because I was promised two things if I came here, warm weather and cherry blossoms, but all I got was cherry blossoms. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the open access uh, field right now. It has expanded. It is an option. Um, and as our two previous lecturers uh, talked about it, um, it does involve some of the same things, some of the same thoughtful patterns that you take if you are an author and you want to make informed decisions about using your work. I think ultimately that's what we're here for. So talking about this, just a quick definition of what open access literature is, right? It means it's digital. It is online in some capacity free of charge, and, and this is the, and, you know, free of most <laughs> copyright and licensing <clears throat> restrictions. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about some of that and how that's accomplished, um, either by the author, the contract, or potentially uh, the open access mandate, if there is one. So why? Why would you select open access? Um, well, in my field, which is, yes, I'm a lawyer and I'm also a nice person, um, <laughs> and a librarian, um, you know, the e-journals, uh, journals in general, and especially peer-reviewed journals that are prestigious, are costing more and more and more. You know, some, something like a 600% rise in the prices during a particular period of time, about the last decade, which is a lot. And in the academic environment, it's, it's kind of built on the backs of the scholars that are working. And they're not necessarily publishing for profit. I like to say, you know, there's, there's only occasional Stephen Kings that are academic publishers that sell millions and millions of copies of their work, but more often than not, maybe using her for tenure and review. And then along comes the peer review policy, and you have <coughs> peers at other institutions that review for free your work and provide you comments. And, you know, so it's not really an economic model except when it comes to selling it. So pricing has something to do with this. Also, there's been numerous studies that open access increases the visibility of your research and the retrievability. Now, suing Google aside, Google Scholar does crawl a number of university institutional repositories and allows them to put their results online. It also builds up readership amongst people in your field. Um, and by making it available open, free, and instantaneously, if they will, they, they'll be able to access quicker. And we think, and this is in the science field, the scrutiny and reproducibility. Responsible scientists, so I'm told, I'm an irresponsible library scientist, uh, but responsible scientists, they, they want to make their entire article and data available so that if you're responsible, you can reproduce those efforts, and, th and that puts that particular theory under scrutiny. So you have to allow that. So we think open access helps in these areas, but also citation. That's really kind of an interesting thing. There have been numerous studies, 70 to date, of whether or not the open access field drives citation higher. 47 of those studies said yes, in an average of two to five times as much open access works get cited that much more. Uh, 17 disagreed, and they, that's okay, that's what, that's what we track these numbers for, but they disagreed based perhaps on their particular role, um, as, as of both our lecturers talk, where you publish and in what field you publish may not, may not be open access is for you necessarily, but additionally, and the, the rest of the studies came up nil, they weren't sure. <laughs> but we think more often than not, it does at least get the likelihood that people will react to it, they will cite to it, they will engage with it, and that it will be read outside of your field. A lot of us subscribe to ebook platforms or journal platforms, which you know are in our field, and our library specializes in this. But what if you're outside that field? Well, interdisciplinary work is the nature of scholarship today. And having people getting access to your work that are outside your field may lead to further scholarship in an area you hadn't considered or they hadn't considered. Not to mention policymakers, journalists, nonprofits, 
citizens and voters that should see some of this stuff. So that's, that's kind of the why of open access. So open access publishing is this, I don't know, fourth, fifth, we're talking about all the different options. It's another option. Authors can choose to publish in a number of journals and even some, some books, and we'll talk about that at the end a little bit, that meet this kind of open access definition. It's a choice, just like the choice to who you're going to publish with. Um, and these articles are free to all interested readers. They're available with no copyright barriers. And I have found over the last, uh, it's definitely over the last decade, but even the, the last five years that I've been kind of steeped in this, it has grown exponentially. It's, it's gotten bigger. And it's not just necessarily um, small shops. I mean, it's, it's, it's from small publishing houses, absolutely, to international publishing giants are getting on board with the Open Access Initiative. Now, I point out this resource the Directory of Open Access Journals, which is one of the larger ones. Um, and this allows you, it must have been built by a librarian, to browse and search <laughs> by topic. And you can see what journals are specifically in my field. And I just wanted to uh, show a few examples here briefly, but this is what one would look like. So you search in a particular field. I was looking up biology. This is Cell Reports by Elsevier. This has been online since 2013. It's an open access journal. And it gives you this little report card. This is what the DOAJ does. And this is what people look at when they're searching for, OK, what open access journals are in my field? This is how I search it. Browse by subject. It's right on top. And it tells you when, and it gives you the other publication charges. Is there any submission charges? It gives you a report card about this particular publisher. And links to the page. And again, these are the actual pages of these online things. They give you the issue right up front. They tell you. They actually do a little advertising and promotion and now with the advance of social media, you know, the stay connected in every way possible. I'm not even sure I know all of those symbols. But the, the concept here is that, look, they're putting this stuff for, up for, for free for the world to access immediately. You know, and the, the, the cell reports and a lot of the other, other uh, journals, especially the science field, were like, why wait? Let's make this available instantaneously. This is, our, this is our particular mission. Now, not every journal does this with Elsevier, obviously, but a number do. The law field has also taken up this particular cause. This is the Journal of Legal Analysis. Uh, perhaps because lawyers may understand it better, uh, the law field has a number of open access journals. This just happens to be one. And again, they make this available instantly, and it is indexed in the directory. Uh, and, and lastly, you know, it's, it's across disciplines. I found one, the International Journal of Bipolar Disorders. Specific niche market, right? A specific field. Though only certain people would publish in this field, but again, from the broadest one, cell biology, to some of the more narrow, we have the ability to see a lot of these. Then you have publishers that are not necessarily the big giant houses that, that you know, were the publishing houses of the past in print that now are adopting the OI model. Here you have Public Library of Science. This was formed in 2001, I believe, as part of a, a major grant initiative to make open access journals available. Now, science was the, really the first to take up this cause. And PLOS, as it's known, opened up a number of journals where they wanted to provide the same scholarly level of, 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 of preeminence in their field on multiple journals. And they started with PLOS Biology, and then it became PLOS One. And now they open a number of journals that you can absolutely subscribe to, and more important, submit to. I'll go over PLOS One just as an example. <coughs> And they are an international, peer-reviewed, open access online publication which welcomes publications from any scientific discipline, which is amazing. So again, freely accessible online. Authors retain their copyright. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but you have fast publication times, instantaneous, you know, no more waiting. Although I like your concept of how come the publishers don't have to tell me a date? Um, <laughs> peer review by expert practicing researchers. So, Again, it's not just a board of editors that are out to do bad. Um, the idea is this is peer reviewed by people that are active in your field and they are pointed out and they give you the board of editors up front on every journal. Um, and post publication tools to indicate quality and impact. In the very beginnings of the arguments for open access, they were like, well, we can't measure this. It's not prestigious. We, how do we measure impact? They've developed tools in PLOS so that you're capable of seeing where you're cited. You're capable of seeing your impact. And again, I think that's important. And again, the, the Public Library of Science was, it was the leader in this field, and they keep establishing more and more journals in genres that may be of interest to you. So 
Where do these things end up going sometimes? Well, sometimes they go into our institutional repositories. And this is, this is from a website called the Highway 66 IR. <laughs> Basically, it tracks all the institutional repositories that are available around the world. Now, there's a color scheme here, and I'm not going to get into it. But there's many different flavors of institutional repositories. And this is where sometimes some of your work goes, if you're a particular uh, member of a research field, if you're a faculty member, if you're on campus, or if you want to upload this. And because of the freeing nature of open access literature, a lot of the times you are capable, um, either by contract or by mandate or a number of ways, we're going to go over those, of putting it into an uh, institutional archive, which then applies beautiful metadata made by librarians, so it is fully trackable and findable, and then crawled and scanned usually by Google Scholar. So, you know, out of a little seed grows great trees. So here we go. The institutional repositories, generally, for those of you that don't know, it's an online archive for collecting, preserving, and disseminating digital copies, and, and arguably, a lot of libraries are involved in this arena because of the preservation and collection aspects of it, capturing the work of the faculty at the institution you happen to work on, um, capturing that scholarly output. And you do that at your institution only, particularly usually a research institution, although there are subject-specific IRs, which you can also donate to. But more often than not, this is associated with some sort of research center. The open access angle of this is that there's a potential for you to use your open access work or take advantage of open access rights or open access life rights that may be in your contract to add these to the IRs. And the IR, you know, they want to fill them. <laughs> institutional repositorians um, want to fill their institutional repositories as much as they possibly can. And they do this in a few ways. Sometimes you have addenda to traditional copyright transfer contracts. We're going to talk about that. You have self-archiving rights that may already exist in your contract, or you may have an OA policy at your institution, and that's a non-exclusive licensing. And I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna start with that one because that's the field that I come from. So I work at the Office for Scholarly Communication at Harvard University. Our institutional repository is called DASH. DASH is for Digital Access to Scholarship at Harvard. Um, uh, my colleague, Emily, is Mrs. Dash, we call her. <laughs> it's funny because not many people remember Mrs. Dash, but I sing that to her. So <laughs> the idea here is that the faculty have agreed. Now, we have, had, we have nine major schools at Harvard. They have each voted by the faculty to pass the open access policy at their school. And what they have done by that vote is saying that they agree to deposit future articles in Dash, at starting at the date of the vote. We're not going back in time. This is always about thinking ahead. <laughs> so the faculty, what they do is they grant something called a non-exclusive right to Harvard for all their future scholarly articles. Now, this is A, passed through the faculty vote, and this is B, affirmed in writing. Now, just to make sure that we're on the same page, non-exclusive rights, not everyone's favorite. Right? Definitely not the movie studios. They want the exclusive right to produce that movie. I always think about that when I read that Variety magazine. But this is a right that says you don't necessarily have to give away the bundle. We talked about the bundle earlier, which is a great analogy. It's my favorite analogy. So the copyright is a bundle of rights. Right to make a copy, distribute, develop different works. You can grant a non-exclusive right to someone else, and they have the right to display and, 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 and make a copy of your work, but you still retain the copyright in that. Which means you can later, if you think about developing it into a book or an article, then you can still give away other rights to other people. That's the point. It's about giving the bundle away without doing it. And only in the modern environment of law can we let this happen. <laughs> and I didn't make this up, and just to jump into copyright law for a moment, non-exclusive rights um, and, and licensing derives from this portion of the Copyright Act, 205E, which says, yes, absolutely, a non-exclusive life, whether recorded or not, Note, always recorded. <laughs> um, prevails over any conflicting transfer of copyright ownership for licenses evidenced by a written instrument, signed by the owner of rights, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have the faculty do, yes, they vote on it and they affirm the policy, but then when they're about to upload something into our institutional repository, we have them affirm that in writing. And we think that that puts us at least on solid ground with regards to filling our institutional repository per our OA mandate. However, 
not everybody has an open access mandate at their university, or at least in the style that we have with the non-exclusive rights. Then use contract law. This is a great opportunity. We talked a little bit about negotiation. I, I was the, a contract is the meeting of the minds, right? And you know, make sure it's on the same page as we said. Muppets and oil and gas law. We don't want people to. But at the moment, there is always the option for negotiation, and I, I think that's important. Um, the default in copyright law is in your favor, the author. The default is you're the creator. So that that's a pretty good bargaining point to be in. I have all the stuff you want. Let's talk about how we're going to work out this. So author addenda, for example, is a legal instrument that modifies that contract and allows you to keep rights in your articles. Now, I noticed on our handout that the spark addendum is on the back right there. That would be one that I would say attempts to capture some of the rights which you may be interested in, which may not be outlined in your contract, or may be counter to some of the clauses in your contract. You know, the, if the theme is anything here from all of us, it's read your contract <laughs> um, very carefully and seek help. But Sparks Authors Addendum or Institutional Specific Addendum. So I know Georgetown has an addendum. I've seen it on the, the web page um, for granting rights to the institutional repository. We have one at DASH, an institutional um, addenda that says, hey, we might want these few rights. And then there's sometimes subject-specific addendum. Science Commons was actually the first one to put out an addendum that I, I read that said, hey, you're in the field of science. You may want to do this. You may want to present at conferences. You may want to art for pre-conference workshops and distribute your paper. You may want to do this. What's interesting about that is we've been experimenting, and I'll show this now, with infographical representations of the law so that people understand <laughs> before they sign what's going on. And of course, you know, the Microsoft clip art comes in really handy with a bundle of sticks and the rights. So it's like, you have this bundle. You can pass it over in contract. Please read. Read it, because you may not end up owning that bundle when you're done. You're, you're not sure. So this has been wildly successful. They want to print like posters of this <laughs> in some of the units that I've talked about. But again, we get to the point where it's think about the future use of your work. And that's where the addenda can come in. If the contract isn't thinking about the future use of your work, then you should. Or if the contract is a little too restrictive about your future work, then you should think about it. You know, will you want to develop it into something in the future? For a lot of our scholars that are getting their PhDs and they're putting their theses or dissertations into our institutional repository, they may be thinking book someday in the future. And there's going to be a lot of editing and changes that go on between the time they write their thesis. I, I would want no one to read my thesis. And, and the time that they write their book. But also, use in the classroom, that's something that more and more we hear about, we heard a little bit about e-reserves, but do you want to make this course, do you want to make this available to your students in a course? You know, can, can I put it on the pin wall for a semester when only I teach? You know, these are clauses that may be in there or when I want to use them in a conference. And then online access, again, about, I think in the, the last uh, thing I read from uh, Sherpa Romeo, which is, uh, if you have, it's in your handout too, I noticed, so I don't have to get into detail, which basically outlines all the different contractual provisions regarding institutional repository. About 77% of contracts now that they have read have some sort of mention of some kind of self-archiving, which includes institutional repositories or on your personal website. A lot of people have personal websites in which they link to that. If that's not in there, you want to think about how do I want to make this access available to people in the future. And again, this is about utilizing the contract that you signed to do this. So retaining rights, developing your work in the future, maybe increasing access for education and research. Maybe there's an open access clause in there. Sometimes it comes in the form of an embargo, which says you may absolutely do whatever you want with this after 12 months. And so at our institution, if we see that contract signed in DASH, we want to Dash, we want Dash to be completely as legal and legitimate as possible. We say, okay, we put it in and we start a clock. Once it's published, we start the clock ticking. 12 months goes by, then it will be available in open access. Again, better, than, better to make it available than nothing at all. I would hate for it to go dark completely. That's a very anti-complete dark forever. Although I saw a contract two days ago. It looked as if the internet had never existed. <laughs> I have not seen one so restrictive in a, in a lifetime of reading these uh, over the last decade. I, I mean, I signed some bad ones in my day when I first came out of law school. Um, Lawyers Weekly owns many of my articles for life. I just, you know, I didn't do the contract. So, you know, librarian, lawyer, and also author that has learned the hard way. <laughs> um, 
but also receive proper attribution when your work is used. Sometimes you can license stuff with Creative Commons licensing, and authors uh, and, you know, will be interested in that. In that uh, Creative Commons, for those of you that haven't uh, explored it before, is that the ability for you to build upon the copyright you own and say, yes, it's under Life of the Author Plus 70, or yes, I, I've transferred this somehow. However, it's a little mini license that says, please use it and cite to me, CCPY being the most basic of, of those. Creative Commons by, getting attribution. So, you know, ultimately for scholars, they want the citations, they want the attribution. So that's kind of the land that, uh, that I'm living in right now. And then there's the third way that this is actually happening in the open access field, which is government mandates. So you and I, as taxpaying citizens of the United States, should probably get access to the work that our taxes pay for. That's basically what it comes down to. And this was first theorized earlier in 2008, but when it came to fruition, was the NIH open access policy basically said, if there is an NIH funded study or grant, and yes, it ends up getting published in Nature, or published in Science, or some other journal, within 12 months, it has to be online for free somewhere. And they developed a whole, NIH developed a whole website, you have PubMed and all these open access repositories of information, and it, it's saying, okay, those should go online within a year. Still giving the publishers room, because science moves pretty fast, usually. Um, but now we have the White House Directive, which was signed in 2013, which gave a very big mandate, and this is, this is important. If a federal, they, they must have liked what happened with the NIH grant, basically. The federal agency said, if you are in excess of $100 million in R&D, you're, you're some kind of agency that has that, then you need to develop an open access plan of some kind. Now, you know, and the plan should get approved and eventually, you know, this is, a, this is down the road a little bit. But the idea is that same type of 12-month embargo that makes something available online for free. And who's uh, in excess of $100 million in R&D? This is just the beginning of the list. It is a great amount of departments, uh, but agriculture, commerce, defense, education, energy, you can imagine the amount. So, if you are at an institution that is funded and grant, gets grants from these departments, and many of us are, then stuff will probably be going into an open access depository of some kind that the government will create. And then you can scrape that off and put it into your institutional repository, because that's the idea of open access, is that we can share it amongst multiple places. So that is what I had for you a little bit about the open access community. I, I thank you for inviting me, and I now I think we're turning it over to go into the Q&A panel. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope our panelists can oh, take a seat yes. at, the, table. at the big table. So we have about <coughs> half an hour left, 25 minutes, and we want to open it up to questions from you. Um, and then we'll follow up with questions as, as needed um, or as time permits. So, um, questions for our panelists. A question for Laura. Mm -hmm. If you can say your name, that oh, would be wonderful. I'm Bill Olson. I work in the building. Um, how and when does a university press decide to put something out in hardcover and also in softcover? Uh, so that would probably be decided um, when we like our contracts are open, basically. Like it would say like we have the ability to publish it in all formats, let's say, right? Um, we would discuss amongst ourselves, like probably volume marketing sales and the acquisition there too, what would be the best format? And it depends what kind of book it is, honestly. Um, what we have started doing, so if it's more of like, we have some books that we call crossover books, right? So they could have a general interest market, right? And they may benefit from having like a, big, a bit of a bigger splash, so like a jacketed hardcover, go out into the market first and then follow up with a paperback shortly thereafter, maybe within a year or two. What we have started doing actually recently, though, is going back to what seems like an old model, maybe, which is um, split run, which it means um, there used to be where uh, academic publishers used to regularly print both a hardcover that was designated like a library edition mm -hmm. and then a paperback, um, which is meant will be maybe for course adoption, things like that. Um, so we are sort of experimenting with going back to that because of the availability of print on demand. So that kind of is in flux with us. It really depends on specifically the type of book, the type of content that you're releasing, and what we would try to discern what would be the best option for each book. So I couldn't tell you unless I knew what kind of book it was. But. Go ahead. I'm curious, 
Carol Sargent, I'm the director of the Office of Scholarly Publications, and um, as Jan was saying, you know, about eight years ago, I guess, we opened the office. So two very short statements, and then I have a question. My two very short statements are when we negotiate contracts for academics, I look for the big three. And to me, the big three are that I ask for copyright in your name, so I guide you to do that. I look for um, the option clause that you don't promise them another book. Um, you know, and that even if it's a fabulous press, it's still a problem if you promise them another book and then someone comes along and wants to work with you and you've actually promised them your next thing. And, um, and there's a third one in the big three, and I actually can't remember what that is. I just remember two of the big three. Um, <laughs> once, I, once, I, once I say the next statement, then um, I'll come back and remember the second of the big three. One of the presses has committed to a date. The University of California Press was here just a few weeks ago, and the editor was saying that they're promising seven months from acceptance of the manuscript mm -hmm. to produce the book. And they're using that <coughs> to win contracts. And I was like, what a smart idea. You know, if you have some big fish dangling you, and they're a pretty big fish too, you know, they're no small fish. But let's say you've got someone who's sort of stringing you along, and they're standing there going, you know what, when you turn it in, we're going to give it to you in seven months. I'd love to see that set an industry precedent. So for the record, I'm just kind of saying, yay, California, and let's see some other people, you know, step up with that. And then my question is about the negotiation, because Jan had said, you know, that you did observe, and I have, working eight years in this job, I've seen a gazillion university press art uh, contracts. Some editors are better negotiators than others. They are by nature more introverts. They tend to be more like we are, academics. You know, they're a little less, if, if they were that hard charging, they'd probably be on the trade side of the publishing world. Um, they can be spooked, but usually it is possible to start the negotiation diplomatically. What I'm curious about is kind of where you think that line is. And I think that would actually be um, for, for both on the university press side with Laura and on the negotiation side with Jan. Um, I've always said everyone will grant you one round you know, politely, but, but how do you, you know, kind of, how, how do you go farther? What, what's a hard negotiation and how do you hang with it? Well, I'll yeah. start, and then I like that question because yeah. I'd like to hear what Laura has to say. You know, I, I spoke to this uh, editor at Oxford University Press who right. said, you know, don't bother getting an agent, you're not going to get enough money, I'm only selling 400 books, I won't touch you if, if you push back hard. But then I asked him about specific clauses. Yeah. And he said, oh, we always give people permission in the non-compete to go do another book if they want it. Or yeah. if somebody's late in a deadline, we'll always give them a, an extension, you know, <laughs> if they want it. And, you know, I said, well, what about the indemnification and warranty clause? You know, what, will you make any changes in that? And that's basically the author saying it's his book, it's original, it hasn't been anyplace else. And they can get you in an open access context. If your book is out there for peer review, etc., you can't sign a warranty clause which says this is the first time the book is ever published because it's not true. So you have to put a qualification in there, but mm -hmm. that's for another day. And there are certain other clauses which, you know, uh, raise my hackles, like the revision clause. Most of the revision clauses, if indeed your oh, book yeah, is, will um, say, well, if you get the first dibs to do the revision, but if you don't do it, we'll hire somebody, not necessarily consulting with you. We'll pay them with your royalties and a pro rata. Um, and then the second time or the third time, you'll get nothing. And sometimes you don't even get credit on a book, which could be 80% of your book because you're the originating author. But there are three revisions in, and a lot of um, presses want to do revisions so that the academic market will you know, they won't be able to use the used books, which pay nobody anything. They'll have to buy a new book because it's yeah. been revised. So the revision clause is something I didn't mention, but it's really important. It's really important. I, I think for the most part, people will, you know, even after you sign this horrendous agreement, they'll do the right thing. But you don't want to depend on that because if, you know, if you get some young kid who says, well, the contract says right here that you have to do this and that and the other thing, you're stuck with yeah. it. But I have to say, when I really, you know, scratched the surface and got into the weeds with, with this editor at Oxford, he said, well, of course we would do that. Yeah. He gave me an example of somebody yeah. who only writes about Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. And that's a book that he, um, that's one in his stable. And I said, well, if she only writes about Mark Twain, this, this uh, you know, non-compete clause says, she can't write about the same subject 
without prior approval. He says, we always give her approval. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't have to. And right. if he gets hit by a bus and his you know, successor comes in, they could, they could take a hard line. Right. So I think the, the long answer, or the short answer is, they usually do the honorable thing, but sometimes it's important to get a third party in there to have the discussion because you know the author is very sensitive to the publisher and the relationship and you know it's hard for an author to um, press so that's why a carol or an author's guild is is helpful i must say most of the time except when i do it we just give authors the ammunition and they do it themselves or yeah. we give their agents ammunition and they do it but i've gotten into some advocacy situations where it's really unfair uh -huh. and you know it should be litigated or mediated or arbitrated but nobody has the time or money to do that yeah. and I've been successful um, I guess I, I mean I'm going to qualify this again it really does depend on the type mm -hmm. of book for us and the type of contract we're working on we work with different types of content so like our contract for a language textbook looks very different yeah. and has different um, clauses than a regular monograph would have for example um, and also, I mean, I know from personal experience with our editors, like we definitely have worked with agents before. It's not like we would never work with an agent. Um, it does like put another party in the middle yeah. there, and it may take longer. There may be, you know, a lot of communications going going back and forth. I can't think of. I mean, I've only been there four years, but I can't think of a time where we like just were like, no way, we're not continuing this negotiation or something like that. Because right. usually, when you're when you want to, you're committed to that to some extent, to really trying to make that happen. Um, and so I, there's no hard and fast rules of like how long or how hard you should push or how many revisions of the contract will do. I mean, I can't yeah. give you like a rule for that. Right. Um, but I would say like we are, I mean, we want to hear, like we want to communicate. We want to keep mm -hmm. the lines open. Yeah. And if the editor really wants this project, yeah, yeah, we're going to be going back and forth probably several times. But we also are cognizant of there is a clock ticking. And especially if it is a book that is maybe current affairs related, for example, we want to get that signed and yeah. and going as quickly as possible, so. I would add something just, yeah. to, it's, working with Forward Thinking Presses helps, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, too, is, you know, you mentioned University of California, they have the yeah. luminous, mm -hmm. this, so it's it's open access book monograph publishing now, uh, they make it available instantaneously, it's a, it's a very interesting model. Um, and the other one was, I was involved with behind the scenes, a book for a MOOC. This was new, so something, yeah. So this was something that Harvard University Press hadn't dealt with before, I don't think any university press. So the book was going to be launched at the same time the MOOC was. The timing just happened to be nearly perfect. Yeah. And this was for uh, a Greek history course. I know about that book. Yeah, and so yeah, the, Greek, the ancient Greek hero in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And what they did was the, the, the individual, the author, Professor Greg Nash, wanted to make the book available to any participants that happened to take the class, which could be tens of thousands of folks. So what they, the negotiations ended up in waiving the hardcover royalty agreement to then open up this so that a person that took the class could have full access to the book during the time they were taking the class. And so, you know, it was kind of a switcheroo. He's been in the field for a long time and could be capable of doing that. But that forward thinking notion of, okay, Potentially, we're going to make this book available to um, tens of thousands of folks that are taking a MOOC, which isn't even really a class, right? You know, it's an online experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're going to we're going to waive the royalty rates that so that the, the press gets the any of the proceeds from the hardcover sales. Hardcover sales were up; they were way up because even though people do maybe get a chapter or two free here and there, or in this case, it was the entire book, they still wanted a copy. Yeah. And the carrot and the stick was. We'll, we'll have a link to Amazon for sales of this book during the time period. It's like direct marketing channeling. You know, they don't have to shop it at 100 bookstores and 100 universities. We know that 20,000 people are going to see this. And with MOOCs, they will at least take weeks one. Yeah. They'll take week one. They'll finish week one. That's guaranteed, right? So during week one, they will have the link to the Harvard University Press account. that says, hey, if you want to buy this and have it at home instead of having access online, please do that. And that was very forward thinking thought really kind of changed the nature of what the contracts would look like in the future. I think there was a question yeah. by the gentleman. Well, this question is for Jan. Actually, I'm going to stand just because Thank I can't you. see you, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so I have a contract with a, with a uh, 
major academic publisher who shall remain nameless, but, um, really but when I was given the contract, the standard contract, I went through the contract, and it, and it looked fine with me. But I had, a, I had a literary agent, and she looked at the contract and she said, oh no, 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 this is never gonna do. And she took that contract and basically rewrote it so that virtually everything was in my favor. Escalating uh, um, royalties based on book sales, refresher advances, all this kind of stuff, <laughs> and the deadline for publication. So I'm like, wow, and, and they accepted all of it. And now I'm thinking, boy, I will never sign another standard contract again. And then I thought, oh, I just did with this agent. You know, she, she presented. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, you know, we represent <laughs> agents as well yes. as um, authors, but we have um, we all we always um, help authors with their agent agreements. Yeah. See, so, and there are some tricks to the agent agreement. Yeah, it I know says, so. <laughs> so she gave me, and I said, you know, standard agency agreement. I signed it. <laughs> now, after I Where after the experience with the publisher. <laughs> I went back and read my agent agreement, thinking, oh my god, I've made a contract with the devil here. And, um, and I read through it, and, it ha and I didn't realize this, but I mean, basically, I had given the agency rights forever. Like, if in 50 years a Broadway play happens, okay, yeah. they're getting paid. And I, and I just have no, knowledge, no way of knowing whether uh, I really made a big mistake up front. So this is something the... the we right. do this too, okay. but let me don't worry too much about it because what they're what they're saying is you they're, this book, they and they earned their fifteen percent commission or whatever it is, uh, for this particular book. But if you do other books, they're not going to own. I mean, you can fire yeah, an right. agent, it's, it's, and what happens when you fire them is they take the position that they got you published, and therefore, as long as this book, this particular book, is published that they're going to get their commission on this particular book. But if then you start you know, selling subrights along the lines of what Laura said, they're not going to be entitled forever to get everything. And if you, you know, um, sell uh, translations or something like that with another agent, without their assistance, they're not going to really have rights to all of those subsidiary right commissions. So don't worry too much about it, but read it next time or c call me. But it's true. They, there are some clauses which say um, they have a security interest in, in your book, which haven't been coupled with an interest and haven't been upheld in New York State. So whenever we see that, we say, you know, cross that out because it's never going to be upheld. Hmm. So you have to, you know, an agent is worth their weight in gold until they're not. And an agent is supposed to be representing you, and if you fall out of you know, favor with an agent or vice versa, um, and they're doing nothing for you, and you want to change, you have an absolute right to terminate um, the agency. And if the cl and if the contract says you're you know you're my slave for for the rest of your life, and anything that I write, you represent me, that won't be upheld. But you can get out of it. But see, there's <laughs> <laughs> one question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Lynn Reich. I'm from the Law Library. So I know we're talking a lot about faculty uh, members, but we actually get a question from graduate students, so particularly PhD and SJD and the law side. Um, sort of are curious about the chances of getting published, so when they want to turn the dissertation into a book. So I'm just basically kind of curious what what the chances are in the sense that, at least in this country, a lot, a lot of dissertations, you know, never get published or never become a book. In places like Germany, it seems like they all do, <laughs> practically. Um, and, I, and sometimes in the um, approval plans and the vendor information, it will say revised dissertation. So as a selector of these things, to be, to be honest, I mean, I kind of noticed that. And so that, that can have an effect. So I guess for Laura in particular, or maybe Jan, I, what, what what effect does it have? You know, how, how hard is it to get that dissertation turned into a book, and maybe what are the stats on that? Um, I don't have a statistic off the top of my head. I mean, it's, it's not high, I'll tell you that. And also, 
Um, depending on the publisher, I will say, you, you noted in Germany particularly, they seem to publish there, There's a lot of publishers in Europe that all they do is publish dissertations. And I think some of them are mildly predatory. I'm not going to make any like judgments no, there or, are, like, there are or like yeah. point yes. fingers or anything, but they would be of a like pay to play kind of model. Absolutely. And you would have to buy a certain number. Of you were talking about that, and you think of that. The buy really a bad. Number, is, the really, yeah, really yeah, bad. Yeah, that was the. That's so the I think stuff. that's that's where maybe that's that glut is coming from in, in that area. But here, and like for us as university presses, and we talk about this a lot, like we we rarely actually will take just, first of all, just a dissertation right off the bat, but it would have to be significantly revised into, I mean, because it is a dissertation is not written even in a, a format that we would consider a book, actually. I mean, just the nature of the way that document is constructed and the way you make arguments in a dissertation is not the way you make an argument in an academic book. Um, it's it maybe even sim as simple as stuff is just like the arrangement like you wouldn't have the the sort of apparatus in the beginning in the way that you would you know in a in an academic book that's an actual full on monograph so we I mean we do have editors I say our editors would, would probably if they have the time and the ability would be willing to work with someone who has potential to like say if you can turn it into the, if you can revise it if we can work with someone on making it into this you have like a kernel here a nugget of some kind then let's talk um, but. I mean, that does take some level of commitment. I don't know every publisher would be able to do that, so. Just uh, as a side, so we have seven schools that have made it a requirement of their graduate studies, uh, and laws on the way, <laughs> um, that they deposit it into our institutional repository, which for those initial seven schools, and especially with the School of Public Health and these honors theses that they were doing, not too many, 25, 30, et cetera, the exposure rates for these have been massive. You know, they can online and look at their stats. One person had been downloaded in 44 countries 1,500 times. And now a book deal is suddenly reality mm -hmm. because it has been engaged with, they have received comments from, and they can <coughs> show that they've had an impact. Where normally, as you know, the SJD dissertation gets put in print and gets added to the archive and they buy one copy for their mom and then they graduate. And they may not ever necessarily you know, revisit that again. So we find that, that some of the institutional repositories are helping that you know, discover scholarship where the publishers may have not seen before. And you're right, it undergrows a massive revision. I mean, it looks nothing like the same, but that initial kind of um, exposure, we think is, it's trying to help that percentage of dissertations and theses that get published higher. Yeah, I would just just reiterate that. I mean, like, publishers notice stuff like that. Like, they're aware. Yes. Editors do their research. Like, yep. if you have it posted somewhere completely on an IR or somewhere, mm -hmm. like, open access, like, in order for them to want to publish it in book form, like I said, we take on a certain amount of risk. Sure. And that involves both money, time, a lot of investment. Like, we have to assess that. And we have to look at, like, you know, what would you need to do to turn this into a book product yeah. um, that, we think there would be an audience for outside of where it's already appeared. Yeah. So we have. And I would let me just say one thing about that. Um, Self-publishing really makes a difference now. Uh, I wouldn't recommend taking your thesis as is and then <laughs> uh, publishing that way. But if if a graduate student wanted to get something out there um, and couldn't get a traditional publisher um, or wasn't satisfied with open access, they could self-publish through m many channels. And self-publishing will re can result in uh, a, a publishing deal. Like I hate to use Fifty Shades of Grey as an example, but it's, it's, it's an a example. example. <laughs> um, and you know, my daughter is a PhD candidate at CUNY, and she's writing her thesis on women's sexual fantasies, which I'm over the age of, so I don't qualify. But um, but you know, just the title alone it seems to me she could probably, if she self-published and turned it into something, she might be sure. able to get a publishing deal. But it's n it, the future is much more, um, it's less grim and much more optimistic than it ha has ever been in the past because of these self-publishing platforms. We have five more minutes and we have a few questions on this side now. <laughs> so Letitia in the back and then. I think mine is quick. So I obviously know now to ask for different things in publishing contracts. I should say, I'm, I'm a, a professor here, and I uh, publish journal articles, so I don't publish books. Um, so moving forward, I will do that to be be able to publish in Digital Georgetown and on my website and, and things like ResearchGate and, and uh, Academia.edu and, and dissemination sites like that. 
what can I do about articles that are already published? Can I put up preprints without um, anybody hassling me? Or? <laughs> I, I think it can be a process of revisiting the agreements that you signed, actually. Okay. And and also you may, if it's not clear, or if there's not like a, a clear embargo period, let's say, that you can automatically go back to like, maybe like, okay, it's like definitely a year has passed, I, there's no problem. If there wasn't specifics like that in there, then I'd say you'd have to probably contact the editor of the journal or the publisher and say, Listen. What are my options here? Um, you know, this is the agreement that I signed. Is there, you know, does this fall under any of the rights that I would be re could retain or actually get back? Or can I ask? Do you actually have copies of the contracts you signed? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I just. It's always yeah, one yeah, thing we didn't talk about. Is right. the, is the number one thing, at least in my world, is. is keep your contracts, yeah, no matter how yeah. old they are. Yeah. If it's in a file or PDF, yeah. doesn't matter. Just keep them. If you sign anything, them, keep sure. them. Yes, no, it's true. Right. But it's that idea that contracts have evolved over time. You know, I yeah, said seventy-seven percent yeah. have self-arbic now, mm -hmm. but they may yeah. not have five years right. ago. That's right. for sure. So, keep a copy. You know, this this should have went right. on my slide. But even if you don't keep have a copy. One. Yeah, even if yeah. you can still say, yes. look, I don't have my contract. Can you give it to me? They may not even have right. one. But yes, then you say, good. here's yeah. the situation. Yeah. Let's say you have no contractual right to do anything that you want to do. I really think they'll do the honorable thing and they'll say <laughs> that you can do it, but you, you need it in writing right. to be comfortable. You don't want to be in a situation where they're going to come after you because it could be copyright infringement. And you, you know, that, yeah. that's, but you have to get them to respond. That's the yes, problem. That's, that's the problem. It really is. Um, just be a pest. And they have no Persistence. At this point, right? Like yeah. you don't need to Yeah, usually my trick is to go to the marketing people, right? Because yeah. they will f <laughs> promise you the sky and then bring it to the rights and permission people. But in this case, if it's been many years, that the marketing people probably have less skin in the game. So yeah, yeah. getting them to respond is important. But yes, pester. That's a great, yes. Pester is good. It's pester. a legal term. <laughs> <laughs> and try to, yeah, try to find the right person too. I mean, starting with the right person or like doing a little research. Who was your online. editor? Who was yeah. the editor? Is it helpful too yeah. if you can if you can do a little research ahead of time and not just send it to like the general general. Yeah, email. rights at yeah, press.com press. is not going to work. I mean, that's probably not going to work. One so, last yeah. question on this side. I have a question. Um, Claudia Holland from George Mason University, and I have a question about compliance with federal mandates. And uh, what has your experience been with uh, um, publishing houses, or journal publishers in particular, um, depositing works that have been embargoed with, you know, whatever the repository is, and maybe if it's, uh, you know, PubMed Central or whatever. Uh, what has been your experience with that? Are the publishers that are claiming they're doing this really doing this? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think th they are, okay. yes. Um, there was the sky is falling moment in 07, 08 when NIH was first coming. It's like, you're going to destroy the world yeah. with this mandate. Um, but we find that the embargo gives the economic incentive necessary, especially in the sciences, I would say. Um, to satisfy the publishers to be able to continue to run their subscription rates and their journals and, and have the impact that they want on their side of the house. And then the open access uh, concept mandate and the government funded public availability gets that within a year or so. And in fact, some are not waiting 12 months, some do six and, and put it up much faster. And we find that yes, PubMed is full of the stuff that's supposed to be there. There are some publishers that are behind or ahead, but what's great about that is that the author can also put the stuff in there as well. So if it's <laughs> if it's been two years and you're like, where is my article that's supposed to be on PubMed? Um, there's potential for the author to set up the role. No, no, and then I guess obviously they would be in trouble because you have to fill out that it's it's in there. But because it's a government mandate, it's got the power of law behind it in a way that's different even than an, an average contract. And so we find in our, you know, when we're doing, when we're searching through PubMed for other offers and doing scrapes and stuff like that, that the majority of what's been published is there. So and of course, there's, there's always going to be exceptions. And yes, things 
get so messed up sometimes. Are you scraping the content before it's gone through the embargo period and then you're turning it on? So is it in, in a dark archive? Sometimes, yeah. So it depends on the journal. So the, there's the practices of the journal yeah. when they're putting it in, when they're not. Sometimes they're, they're sometimes they put it in and put, turn on the clock like we do at Dash, put it in and turn on the clock. Um, sometimes they wait until that time period, but like January 1, this goes in, the, the, the version. That is ne that is necessary by the grant or mandate whatever they actually do, and potentially even the data. And we didn't even get into that, but yeah. um, but it look it appears that it's working enough so that five years later the White House was comfortable signing an executive order that said, okay, everybody everybody do this now um, because it, it seems to be working. Can I ask one more? Question? <laughs> yeah. um, is somebody else waiting? No, no. Okay. Um, getting to the self-publishing piece, one of the uh, the factors that have really alarmed the master of fine arts or you know people who are doing creative works um, at our institution they are like so paranoid about putting their dissertation or thesis in our IR that uh, they're, they're fighting about it so I, I'm wondering if the self-publishing piece might be a way to um, encourage them to take a plunge. I mean, they all think they've written the great American novel, you know, and it's like, oh my God, it's taking money out of my pocket and so on and so forth. But I'm trying to think of ways to assure them that they're, you know, that this is not gonna be hurt them. They shouldn't put their an embargo on their work for three or four years. I mean, if you haven't done anything within a year, you're pretty much toast, you, you know. Let me just say, I have, a client right now who who um, is uh, has a, a book and uh, she won't give electronic rights because she says that the digital book will then take the place of any in a course pack they'll take a chapter or two or three because it's available digitally and nobody will buy the book or use it uh, to adopt it and she's totally convinced that it'll cannibalize the sale of her hard, of her hardcover book, and I can't tell her she's wrong, <laughs> really, because you know I don't know if you're familiar with the Georgia State case, okay. but you know that that was a real concern for academic um, <coughs> authors, and they were picking and choosing what chapters to use and putting together a digital course pack that was available for free to all the students when there was a print course pack, which you actually had to be paid for. I thought Maybe it was a reserve like, system, though, not a course pack. It was a reserve pack. system, yeah. yeah. So, so, can I just briefly, I, since I got a creative writing degree, I went through the same problem, actually, because at the University of Maryland, they had a, um, a requirement, basically, I couldn't graduate without putting it yeah, in the different yeah, repository. Yeah. And they also worked with an, an institution that every, a lot of people work with, which is ProQuest oh, in yeah. UMI, yeah. which I don't agree with yeah. a lot of their policies, actually, and I think it's a bad partnership, but I'm, that's my personal opinion. I'm gonna throw that out there. Um, I, I do think you, for creative work, there should be, I personally think there should be a different kind of requirement because when you're working on something like a collection of poetry or a collection of short stories, like that's, you're usually pretty close to something that's ready for publication. It's not like a dissertation. Well, I understand. Yeah, so like I understand, like I just under personally went through it, I understand the paranoia of that, like <laughs> because I don't think the academic institutions kind of like made any sort of exceptions or understood like there was a difference. Yeah. And um, having like your, you know, collection of short stories appear on ProQuest who has an agreement with Amazon and everybody yeah. else, and all of a sudden your entire you know, work is there. that process even with ProQuest, so. Not unless you make a special sometimes. argument. I mean, I don't know what the policies are at different institutions, but sometimes you have to make a special argument in order to have any embargo at all. Oh, that's not the case. So, case. yeah, it just varies from institution to institution. Yeah. And sometimes they won't accept an argument unless you have a patent pending, which would never happen for a creative work, probably, like a short story collection or something like that. <laughs> so, like, the, it's just, I think it's, it's just, it's a kind of a bit of a mismatch now. Like, I understand from the institutional point of view where they're coming from, but I don't know if it matches up with the goals of somebody who's getting an, an MFA. And but so with that, thank you all for participating in our panel.
If you have additional questions, please let Meg know, let me know. We can get in touch with our panelists and maybe we can clarify some additional issues. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.